Here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. We have a special edition of Knicks Fan TV. The game of the week. The New Orleans Pelicans are coming into town to take on the New York Knicks. And joining us today, we have a great guest. He won an NBA championship with the Spurs, beating our Knicks in the 99 <laughs> finals. Uh, tough to say that, but anyway. Uh, he also covers the Pelicans as a color analyst for Valley Sports New Orleans and is a co-host and analyst for NBA Radio on Series XM. He is Antonio Daniels, but he goes by AD, man. AD, welcome to Knicks Fan TV, man. How you doing today? Fellas, thank you guys for having me, man. It's blessed to be here with you guys. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoy your work, not just on NBA radio, but, uh, you know, when I watch the Pelicans games on, on NBA League Pass, I feel like your color commentary is, is one of the best out there, man. So uh, keep you. up the good work. I, I really enjoy what you're doing, man. Thank you. Very much I got appreciate pass. I got a league pass, so I got to maybe switch to listen to the Pelicans broadcast just so I can hear our guy AD commentate on the game. But it just hurts, man. It just hurts that you got you beat our Knicks, man. You're on that Spurs but, but team. Just think. Just See, think we had to say that out loud, man. You, you <laughs> going, you're going 24 years back. You're going 24 years back. That, that's a long, 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 long time ago. But those were, hey. I was a child then. It, it just hurt, man. All right? It just hurt. It still stings with me today. Come on, man. <laughs> I had to watch it. No Pat Ewing. It was just tough. Right, true. right. It, it was a Cinderella season, man. And to come up against the Twin Towers, Duncan in his prime, you know, just before he was about to take off and take over the league, that was a tough one, man. But, uh, yeah, as you said, 20, 24 years of pain, or much longer than that with the Knicks concern. But um, with these Pelicans, man, what's been your overall thoughts so far as we uh, get ready to take on, quote-unquote, the, the second half of the season of the final 20-some-odd games? Uh. Man, um, you know, it's funny because you guys were just talking about the 1999 championship. And one of you guys, I don't know if it was UCP or you, Alex, one of you guys mentioned the fact that Patrick Ewing wasn't there. Right? There's mm -hmm. nothing more important in the NBA than having your stars healthy. Plain and simple. Any way you look at it, any way you break it down. You can be a deep team, um, but if your stars aren't healthy, you're going to end up in trouble, right? And when you look at the Pelicans, the biggest issue right now with the New Orleans Pelicans is Brandon Ingram has missed 35 games and Zion has missed 30 games. It's hard to win like that. So with the remaining schedule, you have 23 games left, right? You have 12 on the road and 11 at home. If those guys, if you can get those guys back to healthy to finish the season, I will put this roster from top to bottom against any team in this league. But it seems like we continue to have the same conversation. And that's the if, if, if the Pelicans are healthy, if Zion is healthy down the stretch, if BI is healthy down the stretch, um, that's my only issue with this team. You know, it's a great group of guys, uh, fantastic locker room, um, chemistry, camaraderie, almost seems fake. Like guys truly get along with each other. And if you've been around the NBA, you know that's not that's not the norm, where guys are really pulling for each other. Really, with when you have internal competition, a lot of times you hear that's healthy, and a lot of locker rooms is not healthy. And this locker room is healthy. This team just needs to be healthy. That's all. That's my only concern with this team right now. Yeah, especially with Zion, man, because it's like every time you see a healthy Zion, you see the potential you see of, of right. what he can do to this team and to, to lift that team. And the way he was leading that team with Brandon Ingram out and this Pelicans team was number one in the West for, for a little bit of time. And then to have that hamstring injury and then be set back by a re-injury, I mean, that's got to be you know frustrating for the right. organization. And, and that's the thing. It's, it's not a – it's not an ankle – you know, it's not a, a finger. It's not something that you can just come back from quickly. If you've had any history with hamstring injuries or if you had any history with groin injuries, that is a reoccurring injury. You know, your ability to re-injure yourself is at a very, very high rate. We see guys like Devin Booker and guys like Bradley Beal, guys like James Harden have been dealing with hamstring and groins for issues. I mean, for years now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they come back and then they re-injure it, and then they come back, and then they re-injure it. And this young man, listen, he is a he is a force of nature. You know, I, I talk all the time about how much of a blessing it is to cover him on a night-to-night -night basis. We've never seen anything like it. I haven't. 
in my 13 year career and my time since I retired and covering the NBA, I've never seen a young man, a player with this size, this strength, this athletic ability, that agility, and that's that explosive with that soft of a touch around the rim. You have to take a combination of different players throughout the course of history to, to equate to what Zion brings to the floor. It's crazy to watch. Yeah. Yeah, no question about it, man. With that size and that skill, the athleticism and, and the, the physical nature that he plays with, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a tough cover, man. It's a shame that that uh, he's going to miss his his MSG uh, appearance. Uh, I'm going to be at that game. I was hoping to see Zion there. But uh, <laughs> cer certainly unfortunate. When, when you look at the way this team stacks up in the West, the trade deadline has come and gone. The Pelicans did go out and, and trade Devontae Graham for Josh mm -hmm. Richardson. Uh, but the teams around the Pelicans that have improved. Dallas goes out and they get Kyrie Irving, part of the, the Brooklyn Nets sale. Uh, Kevin Durant goes to the Suns in a blockbuster trade. What, what do you think about the overall level of competition in the West right now? Mm -hmm. It definitely it definitely got raised. That's for sure. Um, the Kevin Durant deal, to me, um, was different. I, I'm, I've gone on record on my Sirius XM show and I said that I, I feel like Kevin Durant's the best player in the league. If you give me one year to win an NBA championship and you said you got one year to do it, I'm taking Kevin Durant with my first pick. Yeah. Mm. You know, I just talked about Zion being one of one in the history of the sport. When you talk about Kevin Durant, a young man is seven foot, and with that high shot release, with that skill set, we've never seen anything like it. it, it the fact that they were able to acquire an all-time great like Kevin Durant without getting rid of their big three, I don't know if I should applaud the Phoenix Suns or be mad at the Brooklyn Nets. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. Think yeah. about that. Like when I saw that Kevin Durant with the Phoenix, I was like, oh wow. That's that whew. okay. So Brooklyn must have got DeAndre Aiden. Right. Was right. my initial thought. He had to be in that deal. Maybe it was Mikael Bridges and DeAndre Ayton. When I saw that they kept DeAndre Ayton, Chris Paul, and Devin Booker, and you're adding Kevin Durant to that, people can sit here all day and talk about, well, you know what? They don't have a bench. Well, your bench just got better because now you can stagger those guys and exactly. bring one of those guys off the bench. Yeah. The, my, my thought with the NBA, NBA has always been, give me the talent, give me the firepower, and I figure the rest out. It's hard to win in this league without firepower. It's hard to win in this league without talent. And Phoenix has it. Yeah, absolutely. Espe you know, and, and you hit the nail on the head. When you look at the Kyrie trade, you look at the Durant trade, neither trade netted, uh, you know, stars or superstars of, of equal or, or better value. Now, I love Mikal Bridges, love his game. I, I think he, he he's on the rise. His rocket is, is ready Agreed. to take off. But neither one really, really netted a star return. And so, as you said, with Phoenix looking at Chris Paul, that, that championship window with Phoenix was kind of dwindling. I thought the Durant trade, they needed to make that trade. And so now you mm -hmm. have Paul, Durant, Aiton, and Booker. It's going to be formidable. They're, they're saying KD's targeting a March 1st return. So uh, let's see how that shakes out. And the Lakers got better. Yeah. I mean, let, let's be honest. The Lakers got better because what they were doing wasn't working. So... Mm -hmm. The way LeBron James and his career and the teams that you put around him have always worked is a particular type of player that he seems to um, be his, the best version of himself around as far as winning is concerned. And that's guys that don't need the basketball. Right. Catch and shoot guys, yep. catch and finish guys. Right? So if you go all the way back to Miami with the Mike Millers and the Ray Allens and the Shane Battiers and the Mario Chalmers, and then you go to Cleveland and you had J.R. Smith and Kevin Love, and, you know, Chris Bosh became a tippy-toe to three-point line type of guy. Yeah. So what you do is now you go out. That's why from day one, and I covered Russell Westbrook for four years with OKC Thunder. Love Russell. But I didn't think that would work. Never thought Because this cool. league is not about the name on the back of the jerseys. It's about the yeah. skill sets. And how do they mesh with each other? Bit, bit. Right? Was Russell Westbrook and his skill set, was, was that what Anthony Davis and LeBron James needed to succeed? No. I think we all knew that. I think we all knew that. But now you go out and you get D'Angelo Russell shooting, Malik Beasley shooting, Mo Bamba shot blocking, rim protection shooting, and Jared Vanderbilt toughness, right? 
all three, all four of those guys are guys that don't need the ball. You can say D'Angelo Russell to a certain degree, which is a good thing when LeBron James is out of the game, somebody else that you can run your offense through. But I think, mm -hmm. and Rui Hachimura, you know, the totality of what the Lakers did during the trade deadline, obviously I will put Phoenix first because you acquired an all-time great, but the Lakers are at a close second. Yeah, I, I definitely like what the Lakers did. For me, though, it's still going to come down to the, the other AD, and that's Anthony Davis. Mm -hmm. They need a healthy Anthony mm -hmm. Davis to make some noise. I mean, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of parity in that second half of the West, and, and they can certainly make noise, but it's got to come through through a healthy Anthony Davis because you see LeBron, he's getting those knick-knack injuries. He's 38. I mean, it's still incredible to see what he's been able to accomplish right. this year. But to me... He shouldn't have to do that at 38 years, though, though. Right. You know what I mean? At 38 years old, there's no way possible LeBron James should have to shoulder the responsibility of a franchise. Yeah. Not when you have someone that's as talented and as skilled as Anthony Davis is. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and on the flip side, you, you have the New York Knicks. You know, six games over 500, <laughs> six in the East right now. What's your, been, been your impressions of this Knicks team? Jalen Brunson, obviously playing at an all-star level. You go. Get Julius Randle returning to all-star form. What's been your impressions of the Knicks so far? Um, I, I'll say this first. I love the Josh Hart. Yeah. I love it. Love it. You got and, to cover him down there, right? Yes. Yeah. And I used to say all the time on our broadcast, there's not a player in this league who's not, whose last name fits their style of play more than Josh Hart's does. Because every time he is out, that's, oh, that's what he does. Mm. He is a winning player. I, I don't care. Any championship team you go back and look at, they have have a Josh Tart, a Josh Hart ish type of player on their team. True, right? He doesn't care about stats. All he cares about is winning. Um, huge Jalen Brunson fan. Mm. Huge Jalen Brunson fan. And and I was at when he was at Villanova. You know, I don't know. I should kind of joke with Josh about this. I don't know what Jay Wright was doing to those guys, but every Villanova guy that comes into this league is is, is rotation ready. Ready. Right? Yep. There's a McCall Bridges too. A, um, yeah, there's a um a maturity about them. Yep. So when they hit the floor, they're ready to go. And Jalen Brunson, like if you watch him, he's not fast, he's not quick, he's not athletic, but he's so good and so hard to stop. He knows how to use his body. He has like a and, and I mean this in the most respectful way. He had, you ever played like at a park and mm -hmm. it's that dude that's like older than everybody else. <laughs> you know I mean? like yeah. He's gray yes. all over the place and, you know, yep. but can't nobody stop him. Right? Yeah. Yep. He can get to a spot. He understands angles, knows how to use his body, yep. all of those little things. And to watch Jalen Brunson play, like it is just his understanding, basketball IQ, knowledge. He's so cerebral in between those four lines. I, I, I give a lot of credit to Julius Randle for being an all-star, but I honestly do feel the way that the Knicks are playing and the success that they have, like, had an opportunity to, to, uh, to have this season is on Jalen Brunson. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Hands down. He's definitely changed the way that this team plays. As soon as he stepped on the court, you just see that there is – a level of calm, cool collectiveness right. that we didn't have last season. You know, even two years ago where Randall was an all-star, you see how Randall just was flustered in some moments as soon as he saw the double team. He kicks it right back to Brunson this season, and you just see Brunson's able to figure things out, whether it's finding his own shot or finding another guy that's wide open. You, you know what, to me, um, I felt like last year or last two seasons where Jalen Brunson played alongside Luca really helped him out because mm – -hmm. When you play along stars like that and learn to play off stars, that adds another um, – that gives something else to your game as far as versatility is concerned. Because what we saw from Jalen Brunson last year was a young man that can play with the basketball and without it. He learned how to play off Luka. So when Luka had the ball, he learned how to play out of closeout situations, sloppy closeouts because Luka warrants so much attention. Now it comes down to kick it to you. You got to make the right play. But he also learned, as we saw when Luca was out come playoff time, he can cook. Jalen Brunson can cook. And you didn't really get a chance to see that version of Jalen Brunson while Luca was out there. But when Luca wasn't present, 
took off. I think what we saw right now, what we're seeing right now, we had an opportunity to see last year in Dallas. We just didn't know if he could do it like that on a consistent basis. He proved a lot of people wrong. Yeah, no question about it. And we're, we're talking to Antonio Daniels, who covers the Pelicans for uh, Bally Sports New Orleans and also is a co-host and analyst on NBA Radio on Sirius XM. And when you when you mentioned Josh Hart, Antonio, we had a show yesterday and we were talking about, uh, you know, how what he's brought to this team. And as mm -hmm. you said, he, he just he's a plug and play ready to go guy from what we've seen in just his three games his motors all the way on 100 on, on every play one man fast break and he's given this Knicks bench a lift in so many different ways and I think he's he's also allowing them to build on top of their strengths you know it's very interesting for this Knicks team to have around the top 10 offense but be so inefficient in shooting but they offensive rebound well they get on the mm -hmm. boards They've, they've improved at getting out in, in transition. Obviously, with Randall and Prunson in isolation, they are have gotten a job done. So it's just very interesting to see that, you know, they might not shoot the ball as efficiently, but through their hustle and their, you know, their effort, they're able to get those extra possessions. And, and Josh Hart has been bringing that as well. He's one of the best rebounding guards in the league. You know, um, yeah. offensively and defensively. We, we used to say he was an R&R &R guy, which is a mm -hmm. rebound and run guy. You know, one man fast break. He rebounds and he starts to break himself. There are certain situations throughout the course of history where it's a player and coach match that are made in heaven, right? Like Magic Johnson and Pat Riley, they were a match made in heaven. You know, Magic Johnson and the Lakers, his yeah. personality, that's a match made in heaven. Tim Duncan, Greg Popovich, Tim Duncan, San Antonio, match made in heaven. Larry Bird in Boston, match made in heaven. Josh Hart and Tom Thibodeau, that's a match made in heaven. <laughs> you know he I mean? loves it, man. He loves yes. it. Yeah, it, it may not be the, the star power of, of a Tim Duncan or a Magic Johnson or a Larry Bird. The premise is still the same. You know, there are certain guys as a coach that you would consider to be, that's my kind of guy. And when Josh Hart got traded to the New York Knicks, we talked about that on our Sirius XM radio show. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a better guy who is suited for Tom Thibodeau than Josh Hart is. Yeah, came in right away, closed games, <laughs> getting like 26 minutes. He, he's in there like a glove, man. That is a Tibbs guy through and through, no question about it. Don't forget to knock it down the three-pointers too, man. Like he's been knocking but, down uh, three But here's the thing, well. though. Yeah. Here's the thing. He, he said that Tibbs told him, you got the ultra game, dream light. Any of us that have ever played basketball at any level knows that if a coach tells you there is no consequence for missing shots. Oh, absolutely. Man, listen, <laughs> you ain't got to tell me nothing else. <laughs> you ain't got to tell me nothing else. And, and that's why there are certain coaches that you can think of throughout your history of playing basketball that, that got you, so to speak that understood you, so to speak. And when Josh Sharks gets there and Tibbs tells him, you know what, man, go and do you. Mm. That's usually not the case for a role player. That's usually something that stars are told. You're mm. called a role player because regardless of the team that you play on, your role will change. So when you get to the Knicks and Tibbs tells you, man, you open, go on and let it go. There is no consequence. You have the ultra green light. We you might see the best version of Josh Hart's career now in New York because of that. Mm. Mm. Well, you're talking about star players and stuff like that. Let's get into this game preview. You know, our star player, Jalen Brunson, I know you don't have Zion Williamson right now, but the but the matchup that I'm looking at right now going into this game is none other than Jalen Brunson going against C.J. McCollum. You know, I see – why. obviously we went down through Jalen Brunson, what he can do on the basketball court, how he improved the, the play of this team. But I feel like – CJ McCollum also has to get that shine too because once he got down to New Orleans, I feel like right. they've kind of organized everything as well. You talk about how guys are rooting for each other and that camaraderie. I'm not in there, so I, I want to know your opinion on it, but I feel like CJ is a big portion of that of like guys really come together and just really buying into what they're doing. But I find this is to be the big matchup for this game. How do you feel about that? It's huge, Alex. Uh, when you talk about what CJ has brought, along with Larry Nance, though. Um, mm -hmm. And Larry Nance was considered the throw in, but He's been fantastic here as well. But what C.J. McCollum has brought as far as leadership is concerned, if you're a young team in this league, you're not going to win. If you're an old team in this league, you're not going to win. You have to have a mix of kind of youth, 
athleticism, you know, a little naiveness with some veteran experience. Mm. And what CJ has brought here is veteran experience. He's brought veteran leadership. And it's not just with his words, it's also with his work ethic. And what you saw in a lot of NBA benches over the past couple of seasons is someone will be brought in to be that leader, but they can't play. They're mm. past their prime and they're, you know, they're 13th or 14th guy. When you can start a guy that can go out and get 40 points, what he is saying is going to resonate in that locker room. And from the moment that CJ has gotten here, he has been a servant leader. You know, he has not just served his teammates, but also the community of New Orleans. And there's a there's a bond now between CJ, the community of New Orleans, and there's like a love, a love relationship, you know, that that's existing right now. It, it, and it's awesome to see. But CJ is... When practice is over, he's not going. He's there and he's getting up shots. He's stopping practice in the middle of practice. Like, all right, well, telling guys what to look for. You know, when you're over here, I'm, you know, just, and that's what you need. Not for a guy to say all these things and then go sit at the end of the bench. You need a guy to tell you something and then go out and show that something that he's telling you. I, I, I'm with you, Alex. I think that'll be a great matchup to watch. No question about it, and and you know I thought his uh, his acquisition last year. I mean that that was a primary reason for for right. New Orleans making that uh, that that Cinderella run, and and you know taking his sons, uh, you know giving them a good challenge, giving them giving them a good run. Um, with with this with this Pelicans defense seventh in the league right now and eleventh overall in that defense, what would you say is uh, what would you say is like their key strength defensively? How, how do you see them kind of taking away you know what a Brunson or Randall might be able to do? I, I think they're key strength, and it's it's going to sound um, like I'm not really answering the question, <laughs> but their key strength is Willie Green. Mm -hmm. You know, um, his voice, uh, his understanding, his connection with his players. Um, he holds guys accountable. And in today's NBA, that's very, very difficult to do. That's very hard to do. But if you sit and you watch practice, if there is any... Um, lacking defensively he will he will he'll stop practice and he'll talk about it he is more concerned right now because the thing is when you look at this team offense is not going to be an issue scoring that basketball when healthy is not going to be an issue because if it's not zion if it's not brandon ingram if it's not cj mccullum then you got yonis valanciunas mm -hmm. not him then you got trey murphy it's not him then you got jose alvarado so you can go down a list of different guys that can impact the game as far as scoring is concerned what Willie has talked about all year is remaining a top defensive team because he understands how important that's going to be come postseason. So I know it sounds um, kind of simplistic, but I think the biggest key to this defense is Willie Green's voice and not allowing the slippage that you see, especially around this time of the season. Okay. Would you say that defense is what helps translate to the Pelicans' offense? Yes. Yes. Yes, and this team, and you know that's difficult when you have a a younger team, mm -hmm. because you you know generally younger teams, um, they're ready to go when they see that ball go in. Mm -hmm. You know, you get real real pumped up. You know, everybody wants to smack the floor when they score, right? Nobody yep. wants to just smack the floor just for smacking the floor. But this team is at its best when their defense fuels their offense, right? When they get out in transition, when they can play with pace, when they. And it's difficult to play with pace. It's difficult to get out in transition when you're constantly taking that ball out the net. That's hard to do. So Willie has talked about that at nauseum, understanding that we want to play fast. We want to make use of the speed and the athleticism. But to make use of the speed and the athleticism, you got to get stops. And that's something that has resonated with this team throughout the course of this season. They are the best version of themselves the best version of themselves when their defense fuels their offense, mm. not when they allow their offense to fuel their defense. And go, like adding on to the offense, obviously we know it's going to be CJ and Brandon Inger, but how does Trey Murphy and Herb Jones and Jonas Valanciunas fit into that puzzle? Well, I think it depends on, well, Trey, first and foremost, is a eventual 50-40-90 guy. Yeah. Right? Mm. Eventually, 50-40-90 guy. I told him right before the All-Star break, you are a rare breed that can win both the dunk contest and three-point shootout. Mm. There's no there's no more valued asset in today's NBA than the ability to shoot the basketball. 
like think about it. We mm-hmm. we've we've seen guys that can shoot. We saw Duncan Robinson get 90 million. We saw Davis Bertans get 80 plus million. We saw Joe Harris get 80 plus million simply for shooting. So when you have star power, you need someone that they have to honor their ability to shoot the basketball. Herb Jones' ability to defend, right? We talked about Josh Hart and how the every team needs a Josh Hart. You need someone to put on your best offensive weapon, especially if it's a it's a guard driven league. You know, with the Kyrie Irvings and the Lucas and the John Morants and you know the Devin Bookers and all these guys up and down the list, you need a guy like Herb Jones, six foot seven, six foot eight, that is willing to sit down and defend. I'm interested to see who Herb will guard for the Knicks. Mm. Will it be Jalen Brunson? Because of his ability to really control what it is that the Knicks do, understanding that if you can kind of keep him um, held down a little bit, how that kind of removes everybody else, will he be on R.J. Barry? Like, who knows? And then Jonas Valanciunas just gives you a traditional five. You have to be able to play big. You have to be able to play small. You have Mm -hmm. to be able to play big and throw the ball inside, go back to the 90s, and Jonas Valanciunas gives you that option of somebody you can run wedge five with, drop five, five up, you know, um, five direct, and just throw it straight into him and allow him the opportunity to punish other bigs that don't have a big to offset his physicality. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see, especially because, as you said, it, it could be a Herb Jones, could be even a CJ, but the, but the Pelicans have that wingspan that, you know, I, I think Willie Green may, may try to put on to Jalen Brunson. We've seen teams like the Raptors do that, going with the more athletic wing to kind of slow him down and, and keep him from turning the corner on him. And some teams have had su- that success. Uh, some teams would opt to go to it a little bit later on in the game. So very curious to see that matchup mm-hmm. on how they try to guard Jalen Brunson. And then will the Pelicans go more zone in, in this game? Because that's always been a kryptonite for the Knicks, man, especially the way that <sighs> they do. They could never bust that zone. So I think that's going to be another interesting chess match between uh, Willie Green and Tibbs. TP, yeah. you know everyone's going to throw out the zone at this point. Why, why, why is that even a question? <laughs> that's, that's a fact, man. But, you know, the thing that the Pelicans have, and, and the, the word that you used, CP, was, was wingspan. And it's one thing to have wingspan. It's another thing to have really good on-ball defenders that understand how to use their wingspan. Mm. And the Pelicans have two of them. And one in Herb Jones, who we referenced, and also Dyson Daniels, who will be back um, after All-Star break as well. So they have different guys in size that they can throw at Jalen Brunson. And again, you ain't stopping nobody in this league. Not with these rules. Yeah, You yeah. ain't stopping a soul in this league. <laughs> you know, all you can do is try and make it as difficult as possible on him. And the thing is, Willie has used that zone that you're referencing at different times just to kind of um, throw a wrench in what the opponent is doing. They don't really stick with it very long, but I don't know, maybe he'll watch this and figure that you're on to something. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to watch this. He can just watch any other film of the Knicks. He can just watch film, right? He can just watch film and just see, oh, this, Zone? Right? <laughs> Why not? That's it. <laughs> but you mentioned Dyson Daniels, so let's get to the battle of the benches. And the Knicks bench is starting to come around, especially with the addition of Josh Hart. Their offense is starting to get back in there, especially with Emmanuel quickly. He's added a nice scoring punch, some good facilitating he, as well. Also, defensively, he's just been stout. He's taken another level this season. And we also got uh, Obi Toppin still looking to find his way in this league. You know, and we also got iHeart, who's also starting to come around. Thankfully, he was on. Uh, he, he was getting on short notice amongst the fan base. But looking at the Pelicans bench, you know, we are we know about Jose Alvarado. You mentioned Dyson Daniels, who's going to return soon. What is the strength to this Pelicans bench? I, I think the strength to this Pelicans bench is depth. You know what you haven't seen? You really haven't seen the Pelicans bench this year because mm-hmm. Zion has been out and Brandon Ingram has been out. Right? So when those guys are out, what that does is that takes from your bench. Herb Jones has been out. So now everybody that would be coming off the bench is now starting. CJ's been out. You know, Jonas Valanciunas has missed one game. But so let's let's do this how whole and healthy. Right? You have CJ. Mm -hmm. You have Herb. You have B.I. You have Zion. You have Jonas Valanciunas as your starting five. Now, as opposed to starting, you got Trey Murphy coming off the bench. Now, as opposed to starting, 
you got Najee Marshall coming off the bench. Now, as opposed to starting, you got Jose Alvarado coming off your bench. You bring over Josh Richardson in the trade deadline, right? We mentioned Dyson Daniels, his versatility. Reminds me a lot of the way that he thinks the game of Alonzo Ball. Hmm. And you have a Larry Nance Jr. You have Gomez, who was the EuroLeague MVP this summer. And for someone out there to say, you know what, that's no big deal. Understand that that EuroLeague MVP, that league has Giannis in it. That league has Jokic in it. That league has Luka in it. Okay. So yeah. the depth now that you have with this team is solely based on the health of this team. And this goes back to how we started and how important health is in this league. Because now you can get guys back to playing what they were originally drafted to do. Trey Murphy has started more games than he's come off the bench. That's not what you expected coming into the season. None of us. I got one question because you didn't mention this, this, and this was my guy coming into the draft. What happened to Kyra Lewis, man? I just need to know. Sidetrack, I just need yeah, to know what happened. What happened yeah. to him? No, no, nothing happened to him. Well, what happened to him was an ACL injury. Mm. You know, once he tore his ACL, and you hear it all the time. Number one, Kyra's a fantastic kid. Mm. He's a great kid, like top notch. Mm. But you hear it all the time, and it's a cliche statement. You know what? Like one man's injury is another man's opportunity. Mm. So once Kyra went down, what that did is that opened the way for Jose Alvarado. Yeah. Right. So now the one thing about this team is we are guard heavy. Guard heavy. And by guard, I mean anybody that you can play in the backcourt from CJ to Herb to Jose to Dyson to um, Trey to uh, Josh Richardson. You can go down the list of different guys that you can put in that backcourt and get legitimate minutes for guys that are rotation ready. So um, and Kyrie Lewis has a burst that no one else on his team has. He does. That's the brutal reality. He is so incredibly fast that it, it's just right now, there are no minutes. There are no minutes. Sucks. Because yeah. I, I love the kid. I just want to see I just want to see him play, man. I want to see him play because I want to see that elite speed on the court and just see what you know he can do. I'm outside of being an Knicks fan, just with basketball in general. But mm -hmm. I got I got another question before we uh we get to wrap this show up. Um you mentioned Willie Green as the head coach and him preaching defense. There's been, it seems like a little bit of unfairness on some reporting where the this season struggles has fallen on fallen on his shoulders. Of course. How do you how, how do you feel about that? That that's part of the course. Mm -hmm. When when a team plays well, you praise the players. And when a team struggles, you criticize the coach. Mm. Yeah. That's all that well. Yeah, that's always the case. You know, you can go through all 30 fan bases, right? And the majority of the fan bases will have the same exact arguments about their coaches. He doesn't <laughs> substitute right. So this true. guy should be oh, playing. Oh, man. So true. You know what I mean? So it's true. It's, so it's true. all the same. Yeah. It is all the same. And if there is someone that does not warrant that, the criticism is definitely Willie Green. Because here's the thing. This is a results-based league. Plain and simple. Everything is based on results. Um, Willie Green gets it. He gets it, and he understands the importance of relationship building. He understands the importance of trust. In today's NBA, there's nothing more important. There's nothing more important than a coach's ability to relate to his players. Mm -hmm. I don't care what X's and O's you can write up. I got 10 dudes on the bench that can do that. You know, I don't care what defensive schemes you have. I have a defensive coach. Do my players trust me? Because if they trust you, they'll run through a wall for you, mm -hmm. right? And Willie Green has built up that trust with this team. Regardless, like last year when this team was one and 12 and three and 16, I used to talk about this all the time. But you know what's interesting? Nobody wanted to hear about it because you're mm. losing. When you're losing, no one cares, right? I walked in the shoot around when this team was one and 12 and music is blasting, uh, worship music is playing during shoot around, and you would think this team was 12 and one. Mm. Same when they were three and 16. Like, man. I've been on some bad teams. My, my rookie year, we were, I don't know, 19 and 63. I've been on some bad teams. I did not look forward to shoot around. I can tell you that. So to come in when a team is 3 and 16 and they're high-fiving each other and they're chanting, 
that's a reflection of their head coach. He did not allow them to break. Now, there was times where they bent, but they never broke. And that is a reflection of Willie Green. So when I see the criticism of Willie Green, I'm not rocking with it because I'm at every practice, I'm at every shoot around, and I see the relationship that he has with this team, the trust that he has built with this team. No way, no how. Definitely not warranted. Not for him. Man, I know Knicks fans are hearing this and they're not liking it, CP. I know they're, they're like, thinking, it's, but he just doesn't right, do this. Okay. He's right. Tiz doesn't do that. He's absolutely right. Every, every game preview that we've had with the guests, uh-huh. the same gripe. You know, the, the coach's issues with the rotations. Nick Nurse, man. Raptors fans are ready, been ready to run that guy out of town. You they want call to him Nick Thibodeau. Thibodeau. Yeah, <laughs> they call him Nick Thibodeau up there, up in because the north. Because right, his players play so much? That's right. Yep. That's, that's right. <laughs> so you, you hit the nail on the head, man. When you lose, it's the coach's fault. When you win, it's, it's the players. It's all on the players. The players are great, yep. and and that's it, man. It doesn't seem to be uh to be much much middle ground at all, man. It's just no, funny. No, it, 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 but you know that that's a part of that's a part of the passion of sports. You know what I mean? It, it it is it is what it is. You know, you know when your team starts to play well, what they'll do is they'll say, "Oh, well, this guy's playing well, this guy's playing well, this guy's playing well," and when the team starts to struggle. Eventually, they'll get to the guys that are struggling, but it always starts with the coach. It always starts with the rotation. Who will be next in line? Who will be a better fit to coach this team? You know, his rotations are messed up. You know, why is he playing this guy so much? Why is he not playing this guy? This guy should get more minutes. Like, they run the same vanilla plays over and over. Like, it's the same, it's the same <laughs> argument, I guess, or debate, it feels like, with, with every fan base in the league. To be expected, it's all good. Well, let me ask you. Let me, let me ask you this, and then we, then we can we can I can ask you about the score prediction. Offenses, defenses, like how different is it from team to team? <laughs> you know what? For me, I, I don't think the, the biggest difference is terminology. Hmm. That's all. You know, like when, when you watch games, everybody's going to run screening action, down screen, cross screen. Everybody's going to run middle pick and roll, side pick and roll, angle pick and roll. That's it. So now basically what it comes down to is what is your scheme, your defensive scheme for guarding fill in the blank, right? If it's a side pick and roll, how are we guarding that? Are we hard hedging? Are we trapping? Are we blitzing? Are we bluing? Are we icing? If it's an angle pick and roll, how are we guarding it? And a lot of this stuff is built on the way your roster is constructed. There are certain teams that can't do so. Like, a lot of times you hear fans say what they should do is fill in the blank, but their roster is not constructed to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it, it, it all depends on roster construction for me. Everything is terminology. It's not like there's any NBA team that's doing anything that's crazy. No one in today's NBA is running triangle offense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no one in today's NBA is running the Princeton offense. It's a lot of a lot of people are running variations of the same exact offensive sets it's just variations of it that's all and now defensively you just have different schemes on how to guard us all right how are we guarding pin downs are we locking the trail in are we shooting the gap like are we going to run removed so it just depends on who you talk to and what their particular defensive scheme is and a lot of times that's just based on the way their their roster is constructed as far as what they can and can't do Gotcha. Awesome. Appreciate the insight. When we got an NBA player, I got to ask these questions just because yeah, one of them it's, all, it's all good. And and you know, I I got to get your takes on 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 the drop coverage because when when I uh, I've mm. done a couple shows with with uh, former NBA coach of the year Sam Mitchell, he hates it. He so do can't I. Stand it. So do you I. Know, he he talks about guards just just being as efficient uh, from from the long mid range from three. He he doesn't like it. What, what's your take on it? Well, here's the thing, like. I am not a fan of drop coverage. And the reason I'm not a fan of drop coverage is because I know as a former point guard in this league for 13 years, that was my favorite coverage to see. Mm. That was my favorite coverage to see. Mm. Because when I come off and I have a guy in my hip pocket, I'm no longer concerned with him. Now I have every possible option that I want. The big is so far back. I can pull up. I can get a full head of steam and I can see the entire floor. But with that being said, it depends on who's dropping. Because a lot of times, again, it's on roster construction. So if I have, what, 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 fairly speaking, if I have Nikola Jokic in pick and roll coverage, what can I ask him to do? 
realistically. Trap? No, it's not yeah. gonna happen. Right. You know what I mean? Can I ask in the hard heads? In today's NBA, where guards are so skilled with it's that gone. basketball and you're not allowed to touch, how quickly bigs will get in foul trouble. So a lot of time for me, drop coverage is almost like a let's just do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's just do this because we don't have another pick and roll coverage to go to. I know for me, I'm a firm believer that all pick and roll defense should be skill set based. Plain and simple. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to guard um, Steph Curry in a pick and roll the same way I'm going to guard Rajon Rondo in a pick and roll because they do different things well. Yeah. So and, that's just me. And and I think, you know, that's been one of the, the knocks on Tibbs with the fans because we have a guy like a, like a Mitchell Robinson who mm -hmm. – has the athleticism, has the wingspan to be able to play that drop coverage. He might block your shot in the drop, or he can recover to the rim and, and, and take the ball away there. But when he's out and you have guys like an Isaiah Hartenstein or Jericho Sims who can't play it as well, how do you adjust? And it kind of just seems like go. it just sticks to it. So And they suffer in so that. Here's regard. the thing. Here's the thing, CP. You only have so many coverages, though. It's only so much that you can do in between those four lines. And sometimes, as a coach, you don't have anything to go to. So let, let, me, let, let's, let me pose the question back to you two, right? Understand Isaiah Hardenstein's foot speed. Understand, understand Jericho Sims' foot speed. Yeah. What pick-and-roll coverage makes sense when you're playing against Luca? when you're playing against John Moran? when you're playing against Steph Curry. Sure. I wait. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Fair point, man. That's the hard part. That that's the that's the difficult part um of of coaching for me. Um is sometimes things look so simple when we kind of just sit back and watch on TV. It's like man, man what he should do is fill in the blank. But Sometimes that fill in the blank is a lot more difficult than it looks because that guy that you're asking to do something, the Lord didn't bless him with the ability to do that. And that's okay. Everybody doesn't have fast feet. Everybody doesn't have quick feet. We have Jonas Valanciunas, a traditional center. You can't ask Jonas Valanciunas to get up and trap. You can't ask Jonas Valanciunas to get up and hard hedge because now what you're doing is you're compromising everything behind you. At least, at least the one kind of excuse i guess i can give for drop coverage is at least you keep everything in front of you right that's all yeah. because if i ask a guy like jericho sims or i ask a guy like isaiah hardenstein to come out hard hedge and i get around him now we're basically playing four on two four on three mm -hmm. you know what i mean so now it compromises everything behind your defense all right and on that note let me ask you what do you think the final score prediction of this game will be Oh my gosh, I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. You can ask me a lot of questions, I answer. I can't answer that one. I cannot do that one. Not a clue. Oh, I'm going to guess that you're going to take the Pelicans to win, though. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, there of we go. Course. There, there, there we're getting, that we're cooking somewhere. <laughs> okay, so are you guys, so you guys are taking the Knicks? Oh, of course. Yeah, in, in a close right. one. I'll, so, I'll so, go 115-110. Uh, okay, so this is what we'll do. We'll better push up. All right, there we, All right. There we go. We'll bet we'll bet one push up. We'll bet put one push up to the loser. All right. To the winner. All right. There there we go, man. That there that might go. be our way yeah. of avenging that 99 finals loss, man. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah, that, that one, that, way. That one push up <laughs> for years of heartbreak. That'll erase all the heartbreak, man. Absolutely, man. Uh, 80, we, we definitely appreciate the time. We know you're a busy guy. You, you know, you're juggling a lot, man. So we, we definitely appreciate the time you gave us. And um, good luck to you guys, man. Hopefully we can do this again. For sure. I appreciate you guys. Thanks, TP. Appreciate you, Alex. Thanks, you guys. All appreciate right. you. Thanks again.